Welcome to another IB Environmental Systems and Societies video. Today we're going to learn about the standard level content for topic 2.3, Earth's Biogeochemical Cycles. Let's get into it. Today we're going to examine how chemical elements move between living and non-living components of ecosystems and how human activities impact these vital cycles. Let's begin with the carbon cycle, which is essential for organic molecules and energy storage. This diagram shows the major carbon stores and flows on Earth. Notice how carbon moves between the atmosphere, the plants, the soils, oceans, and Earth's crust. Human activities significantly impact the carbon cycle. Industrial emissions from facilities like this one increase atmospheric CO2 concentrations, and that alters the natural balance that has existed for millennia. Deforestation represents another major human impact. When forests are cleared, we lose critical carbon storage capacity. Trees that once sequestered carbon are removed, and the stored carbon is then often released through burning or decomposition. The nitrogen cycle is equally important, being essential for protein and DNA synthesis. This diagram illustrates how nitrogen moves through an ecosystem, with bacteria playing crucial roles in processes like nitrogen fixation and denitrification. Human impacts on the nitrogen cycle are particularly evident in industrial agriculture. Factory farming, as you can see here with these confined chickens, concentrates nitrogen waste in small areas. This concentration can lead to water pollution through runoff and soil degradation. That can eventually lead to aquatic pollution like eutrophication. The water cycle or hydrological cycle is fundamental to all life on Earth. You already know that. This diagram shows how water moves between the atmosphere, land, and oceans through processes like evaporation, precipitation, and transpiration. Human infrastructure like this dam significantly impacts the water cycle. While dams provide benefits like hydroelectric power and flood control, they do disrupt natural river flow regimes and they can alter local ecosystems. Now, let's examine how these cycles function as systems. Biogeochemical cycles have three key components stores, sinks, and sources. Physical factors like temperature and moisture, biological factors like microbial activity, and chemical factors like pH all influence how these biogeochemical systems operate. Looking more closely at carbon stores, we can categorize them as either organic or inorganic. Organic stores include forest biomass, soil organic matter, marine organisms, and fossil fuels. That's because they were all derived from living organisms. Inorganic stores include atmospheric carbon dioxide, ocean carbonates, and limestone deposits. Carbon flows between these stores through both biological and physical processes. Biological processes include photosynthesis, cellular respiration, and decomposition. Physical processes include ocean atmosphere gas exchange and the weathering of rocks. Carbon sequestration is nature's way of capturing and storing atmospheric carbon dioxide. Trees are particularly effective at this, absorbing CO2 through photosynthesis and then converting it into solid biomass. Over very long periods, this organic matter can become fossilized into coal, oil, and natural gas. Different ecosystems sequester carbon in different ways. Tropical forests store carbon in woody biomass, while peatlands accumulate thick layers of organic matter in waterlogged conditions that don't decompose very quickly. Grasslands store significant carbon in their extensive root systems. Marine ecosystems like mangroves or seagrass meadows and coral reefs also play crucial roles in carbon sequestration, and that role is often referred to as blue carbon. These natural carbon storage systems bring us to an important concept. Ecosystems can act as carbon stores, as sinks, or as sources, depending on their conditions and how they're managed. To understand this dynamic, we need to look at productivity. When an ecosystem performs photosynthesis, it builds biomass. This is called gross productivity. Some energy is used by organisms for respiration. That's the energy they need just to stay alive. What remains is net productivity the actual gain in biomass or growth of the organisms. The balance between these processes determines whether an ecosystem stores carbon or releases it. 
In healthy ecosystems, sink conditions occur when photosynthesis exceeds respiration. That means there's more photosynthesis than there is respiration. We see this in undisturbed forests where biomass steadily accumulates under stable environmental conditions. The more carbon dioxide is absorbed through photosynthesis compared to what's released through respiration, the more effective the sink is. However, when this balance is disrupted, ecosystems can become carbon sources. This usually happens when decomposition rates increase, when there are frequent disturbances, or when systems experience climate stress. Often, human activities will transform carbon sinks into carbon sources through activities like mining and deforestation. Forest succession provides an excellent example of how these roles can shift over time. Young forests act as carbon sinks because they are growing really rapidly and they're accumulating a lot of biomass. As the forests mature, they become carbon stores when growth and loss reach an equilibrium. But when forests burn or when they're cut, they transform into carbon sources, releasing more carbon dioxide than they absorb. This brings us to fossil fuels, perhaps the most dramatic example of carbon storage and release in Earth's history. These fuels represent carbon that was stored millions of years ago when ancient ecosystems acted as powerful carbon sinks. Without human intervention, these deposits would have essentially unlimited residence times. That means they would have stayed in the ground for millions and millions of years. However, our extraction processes transform these stable stores into major carbon sources through mining and drilling and processing. Agricultural systems can also play a big role in carbon cycling. Regenerative practices like crop rotation promote carbon sequestration by enhancing soil organic matter, by minimizing disturbance, and by improving soil biology. Cover crops prevent soil carbon loss, while no-till farming can maintain soil structure and help it hold on to the carbon that was already there. Long-term approaches like agroforestry and sustained carbon storage, as we see in shade-grown coffee systems, but some agricultural practices actually release stored carbon. When we drain wetlands, that exposes soil carbon to oxidation. Monocultures deplete soil organic matter by repeatedly extracting the same nutrients over and over again. Intensive tilling breaks up soil structure and that accelerates decomposition and the release of carbon to the atmosphere. The oceans represent another vital component of global carbon cycling. Their ability to absorb and release carbon dioxide depends on several factors. Cold water absorbs more carbon dioxide while warm water releases it. Surface mixing and biological processes also influence this exchange. The more surface mixing there is, the more gas exchange there is. However, climate change is altering this system too. Warming reduces the ability of the oceans to absorb carbon, it changes circulation patterns and that affects carbon dioxide transport, and perhaps most concerning, ocean acidification is occurring. As carbon dioxide dissolves in seawater, it forms carbonic acid. Even small decreases in pH interfere with calcium carbonate deposition in marine organisms. This makes it really hard for them to build more shells, and it slows the way that corals build their skeletons. While some species may adapt, many marine ecosystems face really serious challenges, including reef collapse, food web disruptions, and overall declines in biodiversity. Given these impacts, we must take action to address human effects on the carbon cycle. This includes transitioning to low carbon technologies like renewable energy and electric transport, reducing fossil fuel use through improved standards and limited extraction, protecting soil structure, slowing deforestation, and actively increasing carbon capture through reforestation and wetland restoration. These solutions require coordinated effort at all scales, from individual actions to international cooperation. And by understanding how these biogeochemical cycles work and how we impact them, we can work towards more sustainable management of Earth's carbon systems. That's it for the Standard Level Topic 2.3. I hope you found this video helpful, and until next time, happy learning.